positive one and, and that people aren't left waiting, particularly in inclement weather. So we're going out to, to, to have a look and see uh, how we can improve the experience for, for people at St. Swithins. St. Swithins is a challenging site because it is embedded in a community inside the community and, and so parking is an issue, it is one of the rationale that we use when looking at sites. And it is probably the site that probably has the is, is most challenged in terms of, of parking. Uh, and that's been a, a very difficult thing to balance uh, access uh, to a site by, by various means. Um, and then parking became difficult when it snowed, of course, and, and the risk of slip strips and falls. And then just on the point, sorry. All right, Joe, do you want to finish? Yeah, just on the point of, uh, I was just answering more questions, the, the point about the, the waiting area with the socially distanced chairs. Um, I'm under the impression that, it, again, it depends on the site, but many do have um, a waiting area with socially distanced chairs in them um, to, to manage um, an appropriate throughput. But again, if people do turn up too early, this, is, this may cause an issue, mind it, Colin? It can do, yeah, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, but we have got um, chairs and waiting areas, but, but what we don't want is, is a lot of people collecting and waiting. Um, so, so it is important to try and not turn up too early for that vaccination appointment. Uh, what I will say is that, that in the main, um, the, the patient experience is very, very good. I, I don't want to, to sort of uh, just focus on on the negatives because we have had so, so many positives. In terms of Pontefract, um, that is one of the sites that we are looking at uh, with the community pharmacy to see whether we can provide a site there. So uh, more details to follow on that one once uh, site readiness and et cetera has uh, been uh, gone through with NHS England and improvement. Thanks, Jo. Um, do people need to find their own NHS number or will it be on the letter or can they just turn up and share, share their name and date of birth? So, I'll take so that. Yeah, okay, go on. <laughs> uh, so, so you don't need your NHS number, you, but you do require it to book through the National Booking Service. But when you get your invite letter, the invite letter has your NHS number on it. When it comes to, uh, so that would that would cover the community vaccination sites uh, for the pharmacy and, and navigation walk. When it comes to uh, to PCN sites, your NHS number isn't isn't required because they will they will already know your NHS number, and there are ways to get around it if you don't know it. So it isn't you know most people don't really know their NHS number. It's it's hidden somewhere away, and we're not expecting them to have it on them. Thanks, Colin. OK, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, OK, so I've got a question here around what plans are in place to inform and educate people in black and minority ethnic communities and other non-English speaking groups where there might be concerns, where there might be questions, um, links to current good practice. And I'm going to I am happy for um, both Colin and Joe and Anna to, to jump in here. But from my personal perspective, um, I'm working on a work stream around people who might have um, access barriers of all sorts that might be practical barriers but it might also be um, information barriers um, there's a link gone into the chat around um, uh, different languages and vaccine information there's some really good websites that have information in different languages and different formats and it links really well to Valerie's post around um, a video call from a deaf person that she's just had who struggled to book because they received an invitation by letter. So um, I'm really happy to take that up outside of this session. We do have some resources to come and do online meetings like this with particular groups. So if, we, if you know that there's a particular group, we can do some question and answer sessions, present something like this um, in a slightly different format. Really happy to work with you to make sure that we know what works best for the people that you're um, working with. We've already started on some um, specialist ed, um, in engagement sessions to allow people to ask questions. And that's already generated some really good responses from community leaders who are keen to work with us and share the messages with their own communities. We're very clear that although we need to keep the um, NHS messages about the vaccination program, that the conversations that people have in communities with their trusted message givers are absolutely key to getting those inf that information out. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a, a kind of an overview of what we're doing there. Um, and um, Valerie, I will be emailing you outside of this message, outside of this meeting to try and pick that up, because I think we could really produce some good solutions there and um, not duplicating at all what the CCG are already working on. Um, we had a question submitted around councils giving support to supermarkets regarding compliance to face coverings. Um, so I just wanted to cover that 
um, in regards to so the council via its um, team working at particularly staffed by environmental health officers can support in workplaces but when it comes to compliance with legal re um, requirements that goes down to the police so if there are any um, so you can absolutely um, you can absolutely report to the council but you might also need to report to the police and the police are working closely with supermarkets and other places in order to help encourage compliance the police would much rather encourage than enforce um, but they so just to let people know that there are those routes there could we have the next slide please okay um a question came in in advance to ask around differentiation between cohorts. So if I'm almost 70, am I likely to receive my letter more than somebody who's just turned 65? Um, that's a really general question around the invitation process that I'm hoping Joe or Colin will be able to um, answer there. Um, and there's another question around um, individual choice about where to book, which I think you've already touched on, Joe. Would you like me to state that, Joe? Um, so yeah. it's it's most likely that uh, well, our invitations so far have been based on age. So we took a decision very early on that we'd start out with a, our 104 year olds and work backwards uh, within each cohort group. Um, it's either tended to be alphabetical uh, in, in truth, or but more likely age based. Um, however, it, each practice is getting through its cohort in, in terms of invitation generally within about. Um, seven to ten days um, so that the delay hopefully isn't too great uh, and I hope that's not what people are experiencing. In terms of choice when you get uh, an offer from the National Service uh, you'll be offered anywhere that's within 45 minute drive of where you live um, so yes that would include York, Leeds, Wakefield, uh, Sighton and, and sites, sites going south. They don't link though to the, to the GP, uh, uh, GP offer which is the local sites that we've previously been discussing as well. Yeah, and, and just going on the, the point about somebody having to go to York, um, that is because um, there are only limited amounts of sites available at the moment and slots available because um, they're not up to full capacity, as I've explained, um, it, you know, what the vaccination centres do very quickly, though, they get up to full capacity, but to, they start a little bit slower because they're, they're all new vaccinated staff, even though they've all vaccinated before and are competent. It's a new environment that we're, they're working in and they've done dry runs, but it never prepares you for the actual, you know, when your, your general public actually turn up. So, um, so for the first few days, they will have reduced numbers of slots, but they'll open wider. And like I say, in Wakefield from next week, we will have the uh, navigation walk and also the, uh, the Morrison, Morrisons from Thursday this week and hopefully that other community pharmacy site at Pontefract uh, early in February. So um, with those slots opening up and more vaccine supply coming along to those places, we should find that people are able to, to access a, a vaccination closer to home than York. Um, in terms of the letters from the national booking system, um, from what I understand at the moment, I don't know in terms of priority group five because they've not informed us, but the letters for the 75 to 79 year olds have gone out this week and they will be sent to all 75 and 79 year olds um, in the Wakefield district um, because they live within a, a 40 minute drive of, of several of the centres now that will be opening um, over the next few weeks, um, including there's Ellen Road <coughs> and also John Smith Stadium at Huddersfield as well. So uh, for the people that live the Huddersfield side of Wakefield. So there, there is opportunity. You don't have to, like I said before, you don't have to go to a Wakefield site when you receive that letter. You, you should have a choice of places if you're able to get further afield if you want to do that. Are you on mute, Kerry? Sorry. <laughs> Can we just go back a couple of slides because there's a few more um, slides, there's a few more questions in the chat bar. So we'll just finish, finish up on questions before we move on. Um, Kerry, I'm just thinking there's a question about the Pfizer vaccine after 10 days. There is a question about the Pfizer got, vaccine got after 10 days, yeah. So basically no vaccine should be evaluated from day zero because the vaccine doesn't actually work until day 10 or day 14. 
So the Pfizer vaccine has chosen to use a very, very unusual method of evaluation, which wouldn't be used by any other vaccine, um, which is they start um, doing the ev evaluation from day zero, not day 10 or day 14. So the fact it gives a 33% percentage up to 10 days is actually really good, because um, you wouldn't expect to see much at all until about 10 to 14 days. So the 90% protection is after the, the, the requisite amount of time, so 10 days to, to 14 days, and that's why um, the data is, is skewed in, in, that, in that case. I think I've got that right, Colin. That's what we were told by the Chief Medical Officer anyway. No, no that's, ex that's exactly right. So it's, it's about 90% at two weeks uh, for, for Pfizer, the, the previous studies. And, and um, yeah, and it, it does, I can understand how everybody's confused because, you know, the, the medical profession in some, in some ways gets confused until they've had time to digest the data. Uh, but it, it, it looks like exactly right. They've just they've measured too early for us to expect to see a significant effect yet. Uh, I just got Thanks, one Claire. question. There. It was just about DNA. So none of these vaccines alter your DNA. Um, so the, the, uh, there is a vaccine that contains mRNA, but that isn't isn't part of the essential building blocks of our cell. That's what you you basically try to make a protein from the DNA. You translate it into into the messenger RNA, and it's the messenger short bit of the messenger RNA that we that we that we get put in, which gives an instruction on how to make um, uh, create a, a fragment of the virus so that the body can recognise that fragment. But we there's nothing in it that that alters the DNA of your body. Thanks. And there was a question further up the thread that I missed, Colin, about um, people's concerns about whether one or both of the vaccines affects fertility. So um, there was an initial question as to whether there was there was some effect on fertility, and it was it was largely because uh, they hadn't done the exact uh, trial. However, none of these vaccines are all are actually all that new, and we have sufficient evidence that, that shows that they have no impact upon fertility. So. Um, Initially, we were saying if you were going to get, if you were planning on getting pregnant, to uh, to wait for two months after you'd had your Pfizer vaccine. Uh, but that uh, that piece of advice has, has now stopped because that with, with the experience and further look at data uh, and further data that's been published that's coming out, there are, there are thought to be no concerns about effect on ability to conceive or effect upon. Um, on a developing developing baby, and the other thing to be aware of is that w although we we say we don't uh, vaccinate pregnant women, in fact we can vaccinate pregnant women if we have a one-to-one -one conversation with that woman and they're able to make an informed choice uh, about what the evidence is out there. And there are there are you know over five hundred pregnant women in the country that have been vaccinated so far. Thank you. So. Um, we've got I know, a couple of questions around transport um, and what I can say is, is, is there's a conversation happening this afternoon around transport and what investment and support we can help people with. Um, the feedback at the moment is that there haven't, don't appear to have been very many barriers in terms of transport being reported as yet, but we're aware that that might change as different cohorts are um, invited for vaccinations and of course as the models change. So there's a conversation happening this afternoon about that um, and the two people who've asked questions about transport might well want to join that um, and if not then there's a kind of ongoing conversation about that and I know it's a, it's a real concern that that shouldn't be a barrier for people to uptake their vaccinations and we are hoping to provide some practical support as well. We just want to make sure that we design it to the best, um, to, to best effect. Um, some really warming comments about um, how grateful people are and good feedback about the vaccination programme um, in the chat bar. So I think that's really important to share with our with our staff and our very hard working teams, both on the front line and I suppose what we've considered back office functions, but are, are no less intense in lots of ways. Um, so uh, there's a, an, an offer of a vaccination site um, in the southeast of Wakefield. Um, so I'll make a note of that and we'll, we'll, um, we'll kind of have a conversation about that outside, Tracy. Um, and we've been asked um, the difference between the two vaccines. Will you be offered the same one? Is it safe to have two different ones? Um, and I think my understanding is that if you offered your second dose, it should be the, set, the same as the first dose. And that obviously would be recorded on your medical records. Is that correct? Yeah, so the, 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 the intention is to offer a second dose of the same type. There are studies actually going on to look at whether you'd get better protection if you were given two different vaccine types. 
uh, but that data is, isn't available yet. And probably that's probably going to happen quite quickly because as we've all experienced, the, the, there's a lot of money available and a lot of people willing to volunteer to enable these studies to be done, which is why we've been able to produce vaccines so quickly. Uh, so I'd expect that we'd be starting to see some interesting information about that as we go further into the summer. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just move on to the last few slides now, just to let people know that they are there for reference. Could we move on? So just to remind people that we do have a national, national and a local testing service. So for people who um, find it difficult for whatever reason to access the national testing service, you can access our local testing service. Um, and that includes um, tests brought to your door. Um, and then somebody will wait and take away the completed test um, and, and submit that for you. Um, we also have our walk-in centre at the waterfront, which is for pre-appointments only. And I'm not proposing that we discuss lateral flow testing in schools and workplaces, but that is work carrying on a pace. So please come back to future sessions if you're interested in hearing more about that. Next slide, please. And the next one, please. So we're aware that lots of people are experiencing real difficulties. So that might be financial, it might be employment, it might be um, relating to debt, but also emotional well-being um, and other concerns. There is help available and the, the voluntary sector have um, really uh, kind of put huge amounts of effort and done amazing work in supporting people, both practically, for example, with food banks um, and being able to do shopping for people or walk their dogs if they're not able to go out, things like that, um, as well as um, more um, as well as support available through the Citizens Advice Bureau of Partners. So that's just a quick map of where those centres are. And if we go on to the next slide, that's a list just in case that you, you need to access any of those. Please pass that information on. Next slide, please. Um, and just to wrap up, because we're out of um, time now, to remind people that we have um, every two weeks, we have a half hour session that's like this, but um, only half an hour and much faster, where we take questions and we give you the latest information. We have an email list attached to that and a WhatsApp group attached to that so that you might find it easy to share messages with people via the WhatsApp group. Um, we're really interested in receiving your feedback. We take all of your questions back. We answer every question that we can or we pass it on um, and um, lots of the people who are designing the work, work streams around testing and tracing um, and vaccinations are listening to the feedback that we can provide so um, if you want to just go to the next slide please do sign up the survey monkey um, link has been dropped into the chat bar and I'm sure Trace is about to drop it into the chat bar again. Um, that helps us know who you are. Um, it gives you regular updates and it means you can be added to our emailing list. But it also lets us know which pockets of the community might not be receiving information through the system so that we can target um, them to make sure that we, we don't have any gaps by mistake just because we don't know. So we would really encourage you to do that. Um, please do keep in touch. Please share any of this information far and wide. Um, and I just a big thank you to everyone, really. Anna, do you want to finish up um, before we, we close the meeting? Yeah, so a big thank you to everyone for joining us and also a huge thanks to Joe and Colin particularly um, for coming and just and just kind of sharing all that. And it just I think it just really helped, doesn't it, getting it from um, both Colin, who's on the front line, and also Joe, who's leading the programme. Um, so um, and now I think it's really we're asking you to go out and share those messages with your networks as well, because you're trusted leaders within your communities um, and in within within your communities of interest and your geographical communities. Um, and, and thanks for people that have put stuff in the chat. Inevitably, a program of this size with done at this speed, there will be some teething issues and there will be some kind of um, challenges. But I think overall, it's just been an incredible sort of testament to the, the skills of our um, NHS um, colleagues, particularly uh, how they've managed to do this so quickly. And I know every day I think people get, are getting the vaccine and I know everyone feels like they've won the lottery when they get it. So, so it's great. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. See you next week, hopefully. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.